let's go ahead and take a leap forward from the breakthrough ideas that we talked about this morning to what it takes to turn an idea into an innovation at scale, a true, true upgrade in reality. Dan Bona is professor of computer science and electrical engineering at Stanford. Bab Goal is back there. Bab is coming. Um, extra applause for Bab. Thank you. Okay. Um, that works well the way to get extra applause that way, doesn't it? Thank you. Yeah. All right. Bab Goal is founding partner at NTTVC, which is an independent venture capital firm formed in collaboration with NTT. Shahid Ahmed is right to my left, is an executive vice president at New Ventures and Innovation at NTT. And Giorgio Scarpelli is chief technology and innovation officer at NTT Data Italia. Thank you all for coming and joining. And we had a really um, good discussion this morning that talked on basic research. And this afternoon, we're going to really talk about how do we go from basic research really into innovation and all the way to market. And I think for purposes of this discussion, there's many folks of innovation, but types of innovation. What I'm hoping we can think about is innovations that can go to scale. And that idea that it really has, an innovation can be an innovation, but for really to make an impact in the world, it's got to scale. And we'll talk about what scaling means. So hopefully we'll talk about what, it, what does it take to get to market? How do we go from proof of concept to prototyping to launching and expanding reach? So that all these ideas, like some of those that you just heard about, can truly impact the world. Um, I wonder if, if I can just start Shahid, by, by beginning with you and having each of you, just tell folks a little bit about your background and the perspective that you're coming to this discussion with. Uh, well, thanks, everyone, and thanks for listening. I know it's the lunch hour here. <laughs> um, so, yeah, my background is in uh, consulting and technology. I was at uh, Accenture for 20 years, but don't hold that against me. Um, uh, but uh, at New... New ventures and innovation here at NTT Limited, we um, incubate new ideas and then bring them to market. Okay. Uh, one of our uh, latest products and services is around private 5G and edge, and that's all the rage uh, in recent months. Um, and we're seeing a lot of traction in the market. Okay, terrific. Dan, please. Yeah, thank you. So uh, thank you for uh, for inviting us, and thank you for setting up this wonderful event. Uh, so let's see, I'm Dan Bonet. I'm a professor of computer science at uh, Stanford University, just down the road here. I primarily work on cryptography, uh, but in the last couple of years, I've been uh, focused on applications of cryptography to the blockchain area. And I also work with uh, the Andreessen Horowitz Crypto Fund. It's an exciting, so the blockchain space is super duper exciting. And as it comes to, when it comes to scale and innovation, it's an area that really drives quite a lot of technology. And I'm looking forward to telling you about that. Can't wait. All right, Bab, please. Yeah. Um, I started my career um, being an internet engineer um, at Sprint when internet backbone from East Coast to West Coast was 1.5 megabit. So we have came a long way. Um, I help uh, launch uh, multiple new services uh, while I work uh, for communication companies. For last 23 years, I've been very fortunate uh, to be in Silicon Valley as a venture capitalist, um, you know, working with some of the brightest minds for business plan from a napkin to building a large companies. Uh, I myself uh, also have been um, co-founder of a few companies. And uh, I'm also serves on the board of uh, NTT Data Services. Excellent. Nice to have you here. <coughs> Georgia. Thanks, Paul. Uh, I'm uh, graduated in math. And uh, in my career, I covered almost all the, uh, the process we are focusing today. Because I started uh, as an uh, academic researcher. Then I moved in an R&D department of a big company. Uh, then I participated in, in the carve out of a new company uh, whose purpose was to commercialize the result, the outcome of the R&D department. Then I created my own startup which was in the cybersecurity space, it was successful enough. Uh, and after several steps in merge and acquisition, I entered the, the entity data family. And today I'm the chief technology and the innovation officer. Uh, again, I'm dealing with the relationship with the academia, with the startups, uh, with the external uh, ecosystems. That is very exciting for me. 
Okay, terrific. Well, we've got a lot of ground to cover here. And, and I wonder, um, this morning, as I mentioned, we talked about basic research. And, and I wonder, in the lives that you're currently living, how important is basic research? And how do you and how do you help others look at that research and find the opportunities? And I wonder if we can begin here. Yeah, let me first say that the technology life cycle is changing very, very rapidly. That's an understatement here in Silicon Valley. Um, what was a cool technology even just months ago is no longer um, a cool technology. It's a pervasive technology. Everybody's using it. Um, so those cycles are used to be, you know, take about a year, two years. Now it's taking months and even sometimes. Why, why even, do you think that happened? Well, for one is the um, the technology, cost of technology is coming down. Okay. Starting with the chipsets. If you look at historically, chips chipset prices have been declining very steadily. And yet that's also improving the performance and the speed and, and storage um, so I think the cost of technology through cloud and um, and other IT technologies has been steadily declining. Okay. And that's that's um, uh, that created an environment where new technologies can be recycled and cycled very very quickly. Got it. Okay. And and in terms of thinking about spotting opportunities and and if you look at basic research and and if you're saying this is what I'm looking for, how do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would uh, ask our colleague from I Stanford. To, I have a lot to say, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, you want me to answer yeah, that? Go ahead. Well, I was going to jump in my, into my own now view of things, but why don't you finish your thought? Well, I, okay. you know, for me, like, you know, even just blockchain as an example. Please. Um, that came from the crypto world, very, very academic. I, I studied that in computer science way back in the day myself. But it, you know, took 10, even 15 years to really get an application now. There's all kinds of interesting applications that popped up just last two years, including NFTs and and um, um, and lots of different crypto token. Uh, uh, and we saw some of that um, implode right in front of us. But the real value behind crypto and blockchain is is within the um, the enterprise side, uh, as a, as an example, right? And I think. Uh, you know, I'm looking forward to those types of applications uh, come back up to the top, as opposed to some of the other consumer-based applications that we saw, at least from a blockchain perspective, that didn't really pan out the way everybody expected it to be. Okay, good. So yeah, I'll, I'll give a very different perspective. So I'll, I guess I'll give the view from, uh, from academia, uh, since that's where I spend uh, all of my time. And so I can tell you, I've been doing this a long time. And for me, there's like literally a recurrent pattern that I've observed in my, in my life and generally in research. There are, are things that we develop as researchers, mostly for intellectual curiosity, that seem to have kind of no applications at the time that, that we do it. You know, maybe we can come up with a story that, you know, seems kind of maybe something that uh, seems reasonable as a, as a way that maybe they would be interested in the future. But at the, at the time that we do it, there is no, no commercial, uh, direct commercial application. Okay. And we do it, you know, we do it just because it's interesting, it's te technically deep, and it's, it's kind of a, a fun thing to do. Um, and then, you know, repeatedly in my life, what has happened is things that look like they are theory today, you roll the clock, you know, two, three, ten years forward, and all of a sudden it finds like a, a commercial application, and boom, the entire commercial world kind of focuses their attention on it, and the area just mushrooms and becomes becomes uh, super practical and drives a lot of innovation, a lot of startups. Give an example of what you're thinking of. Yeah, so actually I have to say this, there's this beautiful example that uh, it's a technology. Maybe you, many of you have heard of it. It's called zero knowledge proofs. Uh, it's now kind of a buzzword in Silicon Valley and in, 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 in the, the world at large. It used to be a very theoretical concept. So zero knowledge proofs were invented uh, back in the 80s, 1980s, almost 40 years ago. And for a long time, these were like completely theoretical things. There wasn't a whole lot that, uh, you know, you could say there were a few things that they were good for, but by, by and large, the vision of zero knowledge proofs sort of le lived in the realm of theory. It wasn't something that could be used for anything, for anything uh, practical. And all of a sudden, two things happened. One thing that happened was in the early 2010s, there was like a major innovation that brought them much closer to practice. 
So I like to say that something is theoretical until one idea comes up and boom, it becomes practical. So that was one thing that happened. And the other thing that happened is all of a sudden these proof systems became like an enabling block for the future further developments of blockchains. It came to the point where now they cannot develop to their next level without properly developing and deploying uh, these proof systems, these zero knowledge proofs. And as a result, the entire kind of blockchain ecosystem kind of focused on this technology. And I, I have not seen anything like this in the last, in, in like, uh, in, in, the, in, in kind of the last couple of years, this thing went from completely being completely theoretical to being the most practical thing in the world, where now there are literally um, dozens of companies deploying these tools and relying on, relying on it for their business. So the point I'd like to make is that things that seem like, seem like theory at the time that they were developed, within, you know, they, well, they could stay as, as theoretical, but very often, and this happens again and again and again, within a few years, sort of one idea and one commercial application just makes the, this, this flower sort of mushroom and enable, enable things that we haven't seen before. So it's, it's remarkable to see this happening. And by the way, zero knowledge proofs is just one example. I, maybe if you have time, I can kind of go through many, many other examples uh, like this. It's kind of a recurrent pattern in, 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 um, that, that, we, that we, I've, I've seen throughout my life and we see in research. <laughs> And I would say that this is kind of the reason why it's important to support basic research in theory, because at the time that it's developed, maybe it seems a little far out, but then one idea and one application kind of makes the whole thing explode. How do you, how do you spot it, which is the second part of that question ah. is, um, I, I'm sure you, you knew all about zero knowledge proofs coming out well before they were done and you called it, but for other people that aren't spotting things that easy, how do you... Keep an eye no, out. No, that's that's actually that's a very very interesting point. I think it's actually really quite important. Communication here is really quite important. So there are old ideas that are sort of lying in the wake, waiting for the commercial application uh, to appear. And the sad thing that sometimes happens is that the commercial application appears, and somehow the fact that the result is already already known and exists is sort of forgotten. I see. Yeah, and so as a result, that really slows down innovation uh, in that now industry has to go and develop uh, the, the field and, um, you know, things get developed incorrectly, things get developed slow, uh, more slowly. And so it's really communication is quite important. We have to keep kind of going through our treasure chest of theoretical uh, results and constantly be communicating them to industry saying, you know, here are all the things that are possible. Here are all the things we can do. And then, you know, it just takes one of you guys in the audience to say, ah, you know, this is exactly the problem that I'm facing in my company, and then the, the, the sort of thing takes off. Okay, great. Please, Bab. Yeah, I actually have two examples um, about why the basic research is important. I don't know about how many of these people in the room. I wouldn't be sitting here if it's not for a basic research. Someone from DARPA funded Stanford and other universities inventing the thing called TCP IP, <laughs> right? Right, the DARPANET calls, right? Yep. You know, a lot of the progress we really have made in the last 25 years on, on communicating, connecting the words together, right? And some of the best companies which have built uh, are because of the internet. So that's one. And other thing, we wouldn't be probably sitting here, um, some of us at least, if the basic research around the COVID vaccines, You're right. which was basically, well, like 15, 20 years ago was done. So those are the two examples really comes into my mind that why basic research is important. I don't need to go anymore. Our health, if we are here, and our wealth is because of internet. So those are the two things, mm -hmm. health and wealth. The other point I will also make, right, is you said something very important, right? Um, you know, how do you commercialize it, right? The real answer is nobody knows. Right? Because you have to do so many research and something is going to be, become successful, something is not. But that, does that mean you stop it? No, because you just can't stop. But there is no one path how you do it. But one of the paths I believe is really critical uh, is, is the decision which NTT made right, to opening the research in America, then in Silicon Valley, Right, and instead of sending someone from Japan, right, from a research center to run it, you know, appointing Gomi-san to run it, you, you know, you have a businessman and a visionary person, right, who, who was uh, very early on uh, help uh, grow the internet. So, so having the mix of researchers 
with the people who understand the business, right, who have relationship with the commercial clients, I think becomes important, right? It's like, you know, if you want to win the car race, only driver can't. You have, a, you have someone who designed the car and then you need the people on the racetrack, you know, who's keeping up the cars, uh, tracking the sensors and providing that stuff. So to me is, um, we talked about, right? I mean, why does Stanford basically always seems to be taking a lot more ideas, right? So, Sun Microsystem was basically also the other um, uh, amazing company comes out of uh, compute side from Stanford. I think having relationships, right, directly or indirectly with businesses or thought leaders who, who, who understand how to take idea and build it a large company, regardless if it comes from this or somewhere else, I think is important. It's all about team. Okay, excellent. Giorgio? Yeah, I think that the basic research will provide the, the building blocks of innovation. If you mind the innovation, the process to change and transform the, the business of a company. The point is that sometimes business is not able to understand the basic research. Sometimes basic research is not able to, to understand the business. So the point is how to merge the two vision, uh, staying together, working together, basic research, academia, and uh, company uh, R&D department, for instance, will be a good idea. Uh, the point is that uh, uh, basic research should also consider in advance the requirements from business. Uh, otherwise, it risks to be too sectorial, too focusing, uh, and uh, maybe approaching a, a specific problem, but with the, a, a kind of a, uh, difficulties in entering the market. So, uh, in our experience, exploring since the beginning the how uh, the, the innovation trends are going to be realized uh, by exploring the uh, basic research will be a good approach for uh, for a company. But we have to create the condition. So, uh, an example is, uh, for instance, the uh, Innovation Center is an initiative we launched at NTT Data. Uh, level, global le level, in which we created the six innovation centers in several different geographies in the world, each of these focusing on a specific uh, uh, topics, like, okay. such as uh, uh, metaverse, quantum computing, human, uh, uh, digital twin, things like that. Uh, it is not just a place where researchers and maybe innovators uh, uh, can join their vision, their background, but also a, a, a space, a real, a physical space, surrounded by uh, technologies, where we invite clients in order to be inspired by the technology. We love to call technology also inspiring technology because several problems can be solved with the, a technological perspective. Mm. Sometimes I discuss with my colleague from the design because they say you have to start always by business, by the need of the clients. True but sometimes we lose what I call serendipity. The fact that we find something that we are not looking for. Okay. That's fantastic. Yep. And you can do this just if we are able to uh, connect the dot between things that apparently are not connected. And in order to do this, you have to <laughs> have a, a, a spot on the basic research, for instance. Okay, so, so the serendipity is an interesting transition to the next question I wanted to touch on with you guys. And, and Vab, maybe I can start with this, because you're seeing ideas, and, and Shahid, I'm sure you are too, but you're being pitched a torrent of ideas. And it may be serendipity, right place at right time, but more often than not, you're going to have to have a vision where you're going to say, wait a minute, this is an idea that we can build upon. How do you spot those ideas? And, and what sparks something that catches you? Um, I think it's an art than a science. Okay. And, and a lot of times you get it wrong, but you just move on, right? So that's the first thing I want to just tell you. So don't just follow what I'm going to say, right? I, I think um, for, for me, what the person who's pitching you that idea, what he has done, right, is important, right? His professional background. His the professional background, background uh, and not just being in a large company, it's okay, but within large company, have you done something? Did you stand for something? Because more, more than idea depends, is, is, is this person uh, is going to be adjust and adopt because you have to go to the valleys to create. Uh, the other point really is, is um, 
the stuff he's talking about, right? What do I know about it, right? Do I have a domain knowledge? Or I know the people who may know the domain. Okay. So I can quickly pick up a phone after there and call, hey, can you meet this person? You know, it seems pretty convincing and pretty good. So, so to me, having the network, the human network, uh, to, to being able to get that feedback. And the last one is the gut, right? The gut feel is because, you know, we don't know everything and, and there is no trademark. You know, some of the best companies are built by, you look at Facebook right out of the college, right? So, so I, I think talking to a lot of people and having the network, and then of course you need a lot of luck. Okay, Shahid, how would you feel about that? I, I think a lot of luck goes a long way, um, <laughs> but you have to create your own luck. Okay. Um, and I think um, to what Vab said, I think you need some resiliency also in the in the idea, so that you can pivot to I see. Okay. Yep. different model. Um, you know, one thing I would say always is, yeah, you might have a great idea, but is there a market for it? Is there a product fit? Like Bab always calls me out on that. Um, and and so sometimes you have to create that fit. As a as a marketeer, you have to go create that market because there there isn't that awareness. Some customers don't know what they want. Yeah. And Can I add to that actually something before I forget. I'm sorry about this point. You know, a lot of people pitch you ideas, right? Of course. All of us in our business in this room, right? One of the key things about the idea is you validate, right, um, for potential buyers. And you also basically create advisors, right? So you go to the experts yourself when you come up with ideas and sign them, up, sign them up as a potential advisor or as a reference. So when people pitch you ideas, it's just okay. like show up, nice looking PowerPoints, or they say, hey, we have talked to 10 prospect customers or competition, or we have signed up. So you have a gut idea, but then you check it out. Yeah, you, you check it advisors. out. So there's two ways. You have a gut idea and build a PowerPoint and say, I need the money or I want to do this, versus, hey, I got the idea. Now let me talk to some prospect customers, even though they're basically going to be, I'm going to be ready in three years, but let me validate that, right, what I'm thinking for the potential buyers. B, I'm smart enough that, hey, I should sign up a few advisors, right, either a technical advisor or a business advisor. So, so those are the kind of things when they show up as, as a package very early on, you get a little bit more attention than saying, hey, I'm going to build a supercomputer because blah, 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 right? But you haven't talked to anybody. Yep. Then, then they get a little bit less attention, especially if you have never built a super com any computer before. Dan, so. is this resonating with you? You're a little earlier in the Yeah, yeah, chain. absolutely. I mean, I, I'd say uh, actually as a researcher, I think we take a slightly different approach in that, in that uh, the question is always sort of wh where is the world going, right? So... The, the, the kind of the key the key point is not to be shackled by the constraints of the current world okay and to think about you know what will life look like in 10 years in 20 years what would technology enable you know and you, you mentioned like uh, east west uh, tra uh, bandwidth was like 1.5 megabytes 20 years ago netflix would have seen seen like science fiction back then and today we take it we take it for granted right so as a researcher you're supposed to say well of course the network is going to get faster but what's that going to enable and what 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 would be the interesting research questions that come out of that you know, my, my favorite saying is that, uh, you know, good science, fi science fiction writers, they predict cars, and great science fiction writers, they predict traffic jams. <laughs> and as researchers, we're supposed to be great science fiction writers. Okay. Uh, sure, anyone can predict the network is going to be faster. But what does that actually mean yes. for, for, for the world? So what are, what are the interesting open research problems that an, a fast network would enable? And so today, there are similar questions on the horizon, right? So we know... Uh, well, obviously, the first example that comes to mind these days is machine learning, right? I mean, so can, you can imagine what would the world look like when machine learning can do a lot more than what it can do today. That's kind of an obvious question. But, um, you know, I'll say kind of more, more general questions like, you know, NTT Research has a whole quantum computing uh, uh, research group, right? So you, you could ask, well, you know, in 20, 30, 50 years, we might have these quantum computers that can do things that we can't do today. What does that mean for the world? How does, how does it change things? Another example that, that I like to give, I always like to, to challenge my students with this, uh, with this example, is, you, you know, in, in a few decades, we're going to have a moon base. We're going to have a Mars base. Uh, when it comes to do TCP IP with the moon, with Mars, you know, TCP IP takes multiple round trips to just set up a session. You know, if it takes you 20 we'll minutes to do... UDP for that, not TCP. That's exactly, no, but that's exactly a fantastic yeah. research question, right? So <laughs> as researchers, we're supposed to exactly ask this question. If it takes 20 minutes to do round, one round trip, what does the network look like? What does the cryptography look like, right? Today, if you want to establish an SSL a TLS connection with a remote site, that takes four, uh, three round trips back and forth. Um, 
that's simply not going to work with uh, when we when we need to do this with uh, with the moon and and the Mars bases. So like one difficulty of setting up a Mars base is coming up with a with a cryptography that will enable us to communicate securely between uh, the two places. Maybe this is thinking a little bit too far ahead, but uh, just to show, just to, I think this is kind of the important mindset that you need to be in when you're doing research. Absolutely. Did you have some thoughts on this, Georgia? Yeah, I think that uh, the best ideas comes from the cross-pollination of different background, uh, different culture, different approaches. Okay. So we have to somehow uh, create the condition, like in nature, about such cro cross-pollination. And uh, to me, uh, there are two main aspects to, uh, to underline. First is, is a personal attitude of people in order to participate in the idea generation process which requires two main uh, characteristics, courage and curiosity. Courage and? Curiosity. OK. Yes. Yeah. Curiosity because, of course, you should be interested in to, to look beyond your normal duties and your, your normal knowledge. And courage because sometimes, for uh, being curious, you should break the, bo the bubble, you break the rules, uh, sometimes reshaping some well-consolidated process. And for sure, for guaranteeing this happening, you have to create the, the environment, create the condition. Uh, if we look at, at a company like us, for instance, we have to uh, accept different uh, uh, point of view. We have to accept the failure. We have to accept that uh, someone goes out of the uh, boundary of the specific duties. So, you need to uh, create the uh, innovation posture, posture of your company in this sense. It is important to leverage people. People is the key for generating uh, innovation and uh, through new ideas, leveraging this kind of contamination. Okay. We had a briefing call before we all talked, and one of the takeaways that seems so obvious when it was said, but it wasn't in my mind, was the idea that as you guys are thinking, oftentimes you're thinking about features, products, or companies. And thinking about it on three different levels, and maybe there's more. But tell me how you set up your minds when you're thinking about it in those three different distinctions. And Dan, I'm not sure if that was your point that was on the call, but. Yeah, but actually, uh, maybe, um, maybe if my, if my colleagues here can, can start with okay. that. Okay. So, so. Well, yeah, I mean, we, you know, just recently launched uh, our private 5G. Uh, can you so, explain what private 5G so is? Private 5G, so 5G, everybody everybody knows 5G, right? You hopefully you've seen that on your phone uh -huh. by now. Um, that's offered typically by a carrier like AT&T, T-Mobile, or Verizon. Um, what we are offering is a private solution that um, is on-premise that you can build for yourself for your own purpose. So it's 5G extension of your LAN, as an example. Okay. So if you have a Wi-Fi, it's similar to Wi-Fi, but it's 5G. Um, and this, I'm oversimplifying this, but that's kind of how um, it's designed to operate. Um, so back to that, I, yeah. you know, my original point was, I think you also have to be able to pivot. It's a great idea to have a private 5G solution, but you have to be agile enough to change your feature, um, your to match the product with the demand, um, and be able to uh, be agile enough to change your business. So you may start saying it's a product, and then realize no, it's a feature. It's not a product. It could be yeah, or security could be a feature. It could be a key feature. Yep. In it, um, it's no longer performance or speeds of feeds. It could be something like security, or the reverse. It could be hey, it's just great coverage, you know, uh, back to the basics. So, you know, the point I'm making is that if you're launching a new service, a new product, be able to pivot very, very quickly um, so that because the market is shifting very, it's very dynamic, yep. as everybody knows. Um, and customer requirements are changing constantly. Um, technology shifts are happening all the time. So you got to adapt. Okay. Can I please ask Dan? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I think that this uh, categorization that you have of um, uh, you know features, products, and startups, I think it is very important to keep in mind when when coming up with a, a new idea that you want to commercialize. 
So some ideas are fantastic, fantastic ideas, but they're kind of a feature in a larger product. Yeah, and we see that often actually with privacy technology. Yeah, and I can tell okay. you many years ago, um, we tried to uh, convince a bunch of the large tech companies to adopt a particular geolocation privacy technology. And um, for them, it was actually very difficult. Like we, we were thinking of this as kind of a product that one could launch, but it was very clear that this is like maybe a small feature in, in some uh, larger mapping system or navigation system. And wh what's interesting there is effectively something is a feature if it's very, it's very easy for somebody else who has a similar product to also incorporate that feature into, into their product. You, okay. wouldn't launch a, you wouldn't launch an entire company just for something that's a feature. Yeah, that's that's kind of a very important. How do you thing distinguish to though? Every people, the gut re human reaction is probably not to create a feature; it's to create a company. No, I don't think that. I don't, don't think, think that's true at all. I don't okay. think that's true at all. So it depends on what your perspective is. So as a researcher, again, I'm thrilled if we can create a feature that uh, a lot of different companies adopt. Success. That's okay. a f fantastic thing. Um, you know, for a large company like NTT, of course, you know, you, you um, I think you want to adopt those kind of features into your products, right? Because it makes the products better compared okay. to your uh, to your competitors. So, um, yeah, the, the 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 distinction I think is um, again between a feature and a startup is effectively, you know, how 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 difficult or easy is it to incorporate it into into a large a larger system? If I can just pick up on that, because you mentioned zero knowledge proofs. Um, that one f offshoot of that feature, if you will, was zero trust network access, ZTNA, right? And, and there's now big companies, Zscaler is an example, just, just take a look at its uh, stock price. Um, but they picked up on that specific mm. notion and built a company around it. Mm. Um, but it's not necessarily z zero knowledge proof, which is very different than ZTNA, but it started from that notion but you can't build a company out of a single, you know, let's say academic research or, or a feature, if you will. Um, but you have to be careful because you can easily see a variety of different companies pop up with similar features, but you know, the next level of, um, of, of set of features that are better, faster, cheaper. Vab, from your perspective, are you disappointed when you decide an idea as a feature and not a company? Well, I think it depends well, which seat I'm sitting on, right? So if, okay. if I'm sitting as a, as, as a board of director of uh, entity um, uh, uh, companies, um, at that point, sometimes actually features are very important <laughs> in order to keep the customer engaged and, and in order to basically compete um, uh, with the competition and, and uh, to keep the services alive and, and uh, and grow the revenue. And one thing comes to mind is I think, um, and we're going a little bit away from the research, so I will come back, but Google AdWords, right? I mean, looked like to me that was you know, invented inside the Google when the company was already there, they were doing search, they didn't know how to monetize beyond you know, powering AOL and Yahoo from the back. And then they came up with that, someone came over there with the AdWord. I mean, it looked like to me as a feature, but look at what they did to Google. So to, to me, I think you cannot really uh, depend where you are. So let's, if you go to the basic research, right, you can't, uh, and I'm not a researcher, so I don't dare to really think about it, like how all the stuff works and stuff, but you can't think of it's gonna be company and stuff. So it depends on which seat you are on, what role you are on. So I think to me, feature, service, and a company, all these three things are important. Okay. Um, and, at a different time. But as a, as a, as a VC, for example, so, I think you have a very- as a, as, a, as a venture capitalist, actually, thank you for actually reminding me, my full-time job. Yeah, do you want to sit here? Because that was really good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. I think as a, as a venture capitalist, right, who gives money, I think we always shoot for basically uh, to the company, right, and, and a very large company, that that's what we look for, so. Yeah. Excellent. Georgia, how about from your perspective? Yeah, how, I, how are you thinking about I, I bring this? here the perspective of a company that, uh, that looks, first of all, uh, to ideas that can change the game in, uh, uh, in solving, for instance, a problem for our, for our clients. So one aspect that we should evaluate from an idea that could be a feature, a company, or a, a product is the ability to solve a, a, a problem with an original perspective. Okay. So, in, in this sense, uh, feature or product should be 
open, so it should be uh, scalable, should be uh, adaptable, flexible. So a lot of characteristics that uh, are necessary to be investigated in order to understand if they can actually go through the business. Uh, if we look at companies, we look at partners. So the characteristic that we expect from a company is to share our, uh, uh, our uh, perspective. We should be on the same page also in terms of values, in terms of uh, strategic vision. And in this case, uh, uh, we are used to integrate the offering of uh, maybe uh, companies that could become partner of us uh, uh, only if they are complementary to what we are already able to do by ourselves. So okay. it's a different perspective uh, if we consider the, the venture capitalists because they have to put money in a company if they uh, foresee kind of uh, grow, growth perspective in terms of financial aspects. But for us, it's important to consider uh, all the aspects in the perspective of solving a problem for our clients. So these aspects are those that we uh, evaluate first. Okay. When we began this session, we talked about the importance of scalability in deciding out ideas. And maybe, um, based on this conversation of features, products, or companies, scalability is not the big question on the table, but I'd like you guys to talk about that. How do you think, Dan, about scalability? And if you think about an idea, do you automatically get it and then say, can I scale it? Or how does that work? Oh boy, so you're asking the academic about how to scale things. <laughs> um, uh, well, actually, if, if there's one thing we learned is that academics, we're, we're not supposed to actually release products. Okay. So, <laughs> we, 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 we've done that a couple of times and, and people then ask us to maintain the products. Okay. And, but the students are already gone and it becomes very, very, very uh, difficult, obviously. Um, so you, yeah, so um, I guess when we want to take an idea to the next level, the next thing to do is to create a startup, right? And I, I have to tell you that the startups don't usually come from, uh, or they're not primarily driven by professors, they're primarily driven by, by students, of course. Um, so they need to go when they graduate, they need, they're wondering what to do next. And so, you know, I guess, it, it's, um, I guess at Stanford, we're very fortunate that really all we have to do is get in the car, drive up Sand Hill Road and, uh, and try and, and pitch the idea and see, see how it goes. So that's kind of the, that's, that's our scaling path, right? But do you think about if you're working with students, do you challenge them on scalability as something that they have to be thinking about? Yeah, of course, of course. That's, that goes without saying. If something is, you know, a fit, I guess this also has to do with, uh, you know, total accessible market and such, TAM, yep. in general. If, if something doesn't have a very large TAM, that's not a very interesting, uh, that's not a very interesting to explore, thing to explore further. And so that, that is kind of the first thing we, we look at. I'm sure you guys do, 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 do the same. But I, I would say that kind of much more important than that is, is the actual product market fit question. Okay. That, that really is, is, do people actually want to use what you, are, what you are proposing here? Yeah, I mean, if I can add, please. I mean, I'm, I'm used to that product market fit question all the time. Uh, but, you know, let's take, um, you know, GPT-4 just got released yesterday. How many of you guys played with it? Amazing. Um, yeah, I had I had to do a um, differential calculus uh, question, and I put it in there, and it within seconds answered it very eloquently. And then I asked it to um, draw a wire wire diagram for a website. I took a picture of a you know uh, something I drew on a napkin on a plane, by the way, and I uploaded that, and it drew me a wireframe diagram for that website that it imagined what it would be. Now, is there a product fit? Is there, is there a scale associated with it? What we're seeing with AI, particularly with GPT-4 and OpenAI, is akin to web, um, World Wide Web, if you will. Um, and it's very transformational, talk about scale, that I don't think they were thinking about scale when they were building this. You're right. I don't, there was, they weren't, but the just because they opened it up to the masses, people like me and all the students and my 11-year-old, um, it has uh, really ushered a source of imagination none of us really had until now. Right. And so 
Yeah, you know, do you think about scale when you're thinking about an idea? I bet those guys at OpenAI weren't thinking about it that way. Okay, Bab? I think scale, uh, scale starts from second minute because when someone is pitching your idea, as a, as a venture capitalist I'm talking now, first thing that comes to mind is the entrepreneur, the founder, can he scale? <laughs> Right. So that's a leadership question. But but it's scale. Right. Actually, it's not leadership. The word we use actually in venture capital language is scale. Right. Can he scale? Right. When we hire the first uh, sales leader, you know, is it a zero to one, five to ten, ten to you know fifty? So I think scale is 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 very important. In in my business, I will say the first question always comes in. We take it for granted the technology they're building can be built. Uh, um, and it can work and scale. But I think it's, to me is is about the human part of it. That becomes the most important. Okay, part. that's a different twist on scale than I was thinking, but you're gonna lead me very nicely into the next path. And, and so Giorgio, I'm gonna maybe move this into because I think um, inevitably the part of, of building any of these things comes from spotting leaders and yeah. spotting people that could be teams. How do you think about what Vab was talking about when you're doing it in your world. Yeah, I think that uh, people is crucial uh, to evaluate also the scalability. At the end, uh, scalability is something that you have to evaluate uh, uh, among di towards different uh, uh, domains. For instance, technical scalability, for sure. You have to create a product that is ready to, to scale in terms of numbers, in terms of performance. But we have to also evaluate business scalability because uh, you, you, you have to consider if your product or solution could ramp up in the market appropriately, but also your organization capability to scale up. So this means the mentality of people living there, uh, the, 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 the willingness to become big. Sometimes it is not uh, natural moving from uh, being a, a small startup uh, with a specific focus on a specific aspect that maybe is uh, enough for uh, uh, generating a, a certain level of business to the next stage. Okay. That means that you need uh, people with the right commitment for doing this, that are able to set up the right organization, leveraging products that can uh, count on a kind of architectural design, for instance, in order to be ready to scale. All these aspects are again related to the attitude of people to grow up uh, on a certain page. Basically. Okay, well, one of the, and if we have time, I wanna ask about this, but I was reading a, 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 an analysis of, of what happened with SVB and the writer of the piece ended up saying, well, they only looked for founders and leaders who were like them. And so they got into groupthink and that was one of the things that actually led to their problems. How does this idea in your mind of spotting leaders, thinking about leaders, how do you look outside what you may say is an obvious person that should be able to do something? Yeah, herd mentality is clearly very dangerous as we just recently uh, discovered, uh, especially in the tech space, right? And, um, and hopefully we have will offer his perspective on the whole SVB uh, saga. but. I think, look, I think diversity is a big point. I think you mentioned that um, you have to have not only diversity of thinking, um, but different backgrounds. Um, that, will, uh, that will drive innovation and product development in a way that is- when you, when you say different backgrounds, what does that mean? I, uh, so, you know, even in my team, um, I have people with strong technology acumen but also very good marketing. Acumen. Okay. And then there is folks that just uh, have a variety of different backgrounds from, you know, in the business side. So I think that's important because um, you could have a very strong personality driving a technology agenda, but not necessarily a very good, say, a business agenda or go to market Got it. perspective. And so, yeah, I think diversity of ideas, especially in the product creation, early stages of product development is crucial. 
Okay. Is that talked about in your world very much? Yeah, quite a bit, actually. I think, uh, I think just to build on what you, what you just said, I think it's, uh, being a strong communicator is, uh, is really, really quite important. Um, you know, you have to be able to communicate your ideas. You have to be able to get people excited about uh, where, where you're headed. That, that enables you to hire more people, hire the right people, and so, and so on. So um, definitely, I would say, like, uh, uh, if, um, you know, strong communication skills are kind of absolutely necessary in this, in this area. Okay. I, I'm really concerned looking at the clock and realizing I don't have a lot of time and I've got a hundred more questions to ask. So I'm going to look at the list and pull out some that are really jumping out at me. But, but one of them, and I, and I don't know who to start this with, but we're in a global marketplace in a pretty significant way right now. And the world has a lot of tensions in it. And I'm wondering in this whole world and the geopolitical pressures, how is that something that you think about, that you navigate, or do you say, you know something, we have to do what we're doing, and that's not necessarily something we have to put a lot of energy into? I think that uh, the, the, the vision of uh, what is uh, uh, going on uh, in, this, in this moment is, is crucial for us, first of all, to understand the, the, the future. Uh, I think that... Uh, uh, Vision of the future is uh, uh, an aspect we have to consider in our uh, in, in, in our perspective uh, as a company or as a researcher, trying to understand what is uh, going on. Also, considering what happened uh, recently for uh, the, for the failure of the, the, the uh, Silicon Valley Bank. Uh -huh. Uh, so I, I, I was uh, uh, reflecting what what's the, the impact of this to our uh, perspective. So, of course, we are concerned for a possible financial impact. Okay. But we discovered that there is a, a weakness in the system. That uh, is a, so, uh, why we are in this situation. Because maybe looking at the startup ecosystem, uh, they live in a kind of bubble sometime. Uh, they have their ceremony their rituality. They uh, ask funds for maybe uh, three-year uh, uh, investment for generating an MVP. So my question is, are those people prepared to fade with the market, actually? Are those people uh, able to uh, be res resilient toward a, a normal phenomenon that is an increase of, uh, of rate? Uh, interest rate. So uh, we have to, uh, uh, my consideration in this is we should uh, realize a kind of back to basic okay. approach. Let me, I'm going to cut you off because I only have two and a half minutes. And I want to ask a question that I, I hope everybody will also really appreciate. But I'd love you to each just go down the line and say as guys that are masters of innovation and spotting innovation, what is it that you're like really excited about right now that, that's coming or you think is coming? I'll be very brief. Um, I think AI and generative AI is something obviously, and it's very clear to this crowd here, um, it's something we need to all pay attention to. Um, it has ethical implications. It has political implications. Um, so it can be... And I, I don't want to call out AI as a technology that's dangerous. People are dangerous. Technology is never dangerous. We, we have to um, make sure that it is used in the right way. Okay. Dan. Uh, I can, by the way, I can tell you the, the large language model class in our, in our, in our department was the largest last quarter. It was the okay. largest class in the department. Not surprisingly. Right. Everybody, everybody is interested. I would say that uh, the way I'd answer your question is, uh, honestly, I'm, I'm excited by the, the technology that's being driven by blockchains. Yeah. So okay. when you look at the science behind blockchains, it's really quite remarkable. It's driving the development of distributed systems, cryptography, programming languages, verification tools, economics, uh, political science. There's just so much new technology that's being driven by this, by this ecosystem that that is super exciting to me. Okay. For, for me, computer science compute and storage coming together with healthcare data is going to be game changing. We're going to make more advance in the next 10 years than we did probably in 50 and 100 years okay. before. My goodness. So I think um, 
I want to live more healthier okay. as I age. Um, and we, we have so many diseases which we need to cure. Uh, and understanding human brain, you know, we're dealing with, you know, we talk about, now I'm going to go back and answer your question for a second, right? We're talking about what's coming in the future issues, but now social media have a, such a huge impact on the kids' brains, always on, you know, uh, adults are having mental health challenges and we need better understanding. So I think for that, healthcare, data, compute, AI, ML, whatever you can apply it. All great answers. So. Giorgio, wrap us up. Wrap us up. I mentioned hyper automation and the merge between the physical and digital world for a new human centric experience. Okay. Uh, look at that right at the bottom <laughs> line. Um, you guys are wonderful. I can't wait to see if, if all the things we're talking about as they developed and you kept us all wanting more. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.